Ambassador to Mexico years ago. I, I graduated BYU in 2009. And he talked me out. I, I studied international relations in Russia and planned to go into the Foreign Service, and he basically talked me out of it in his lecture. So maybe today I'll talk all of you out of venture capital. <laughs> we'll see. But um, no, really loved my time here at BYU. And um, uh, as I understand it, the purpose of today's lecture is in part to uh, really just share a story. Of, of how background in politics or political science um, or studying that can, can go career-wise, um, one path among many. Um, I've, I've heard it quipped that the only thing you can do with an international relations degree or political science degree is go run a country. So that's a pretty limited uh, um, job market. And um, so lots of, lots of ways to go with it. And um, so I'll share my story with you today and then a couple of frameworks has been helpful for me, Ryan suggested we talk about a new skill. So my two new skills would basically be two philosophy frameworks. And um, maybe that'll give me some extra points and a cookie, we'll see. But, um, so I was uh, born in uh, Logan, Utah. My parents have met here, but um, that is an ag person. The, uh, actually, both my parents grew up traveling the world as uh, uh, military. So, grandparents' generations both went in the military, mostly from Utah. And um, <clears throat> but my my dad kind of reacted against that and wanted to live more of a rooted life, um, and that's more his personality. And he uh, uh, spent his summers growing up with his grandfather in Beaver Dam, Utah. Does anyone know where Beaver Dam is? Okay. Do you know where Tree Mountain is? Mm -hmm. So it's like just east of Tremont and on the way to Cache Valley. So um, that's where his, his uh, grandpa Clark Bowen's farm was. And he, that really impacted him. And uh, that's the life he wanted to live, really. So he became a veterinarian. Uh, and I'm the oldest of five boys. And he bought a practice in Buffalo, Wyoming. We moved there when I was five. Does anyone know where Buffalo, Wyoming is? This is like a geographic. <laughs> I mean, you do? How do you know where that is? Because it is on the way to pheasant hunting. Oh. <laughs> Montana or, Nebraska or, or South North Dakota. Dakota. North Dakota. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. The Dakotas. Yeah. Makes sense. Field game. Um, that's good. I did have did shot gun hunting occasionally growing up. So Ryan and I have this in common. We, we probably both grew up hunting and fishing. So great place to grow up. Town of 4,000 people. Um, and uh, wonderful. I left... Uh, well, let's see. Graduated high school and worked for a year to save up money to, to go serve a mission. So I didn't come to school. And at the time, you couldn't go on a mission until you were 19. Um, and so I had a year. And um, so I worked and, uh, and then went on a mission to Donetsk, Ukraine, um, which unfortunately at the moment is not a mission. Um, there are still two missions in Ukraine, Neprepetrovsk and Kiev. And uh, has anyone been in Russia? Yeah, Corey has. Um, within the last two years? Uh, no. So uh, I had a really wonderful experience there, and it was life changing for me. Um, so I, and I, and thinking about just career, um, one thing that did for me was um, sort of spoiled me for like, meaning in my work. After after that, I had a hard time and, and really searched diligently for years, I would say, to try and find work that was meaningful. Because missionary work is really meaningful, right? And um, and so that it shaped me in, in that way, and um, and it took a lot of searching. <laughs> so as you'll you'll see in my career story, it's been extremely nonlinear. I've done many different things and. Like another word for Renaissance person is just eighty. So, um, like, like euphemisms and dysphemisms for everything, right? But uh, so I came to BYU and uh, didn't know anyone here when I got here. Um, and lived with my grandparents, other grandparents, in uh, Pleasant Grove, Utah, first year, and um, that was uh, fun. And, uh, 
studied international relations in Russia. And my paternal grandfather had um, gone, spent his whole career in the Air Force and then ended up in NATO, the last decade of the Cold War in Brussels, Belgium. And when I was four, I spent a summer with them. I fell in love with Belgium and learned some French words. Uh, and uh, he told me that the Foreign Service would have been better training for what he ended up doing at the end of his career than the military. And so that, that impacted me, and I thought, well, all right, I'm going to go into the Foreign Service then, because I admire my grandfather a lot. And, uh, and so that was the plan. Um, yeah, I really loved my, my studies here, uh, but I... Uh, about halfway through school, listen to this lecture, and I forget the name of the, amb the ambassador. I'm, I'm wishing I could remember. It's in Mexico. Do you? 2011? Uh, it would have been like 20, 2007 or 8. Oh. In Mexico. We yeah. had many Mexican ambassadors. Yeah. Or maybe it's a, a diplomat. Um, and, 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 uh, yeah. It should be easy to Fox? Find. Was it Fox? Uh, anyway. I, don't, I don't think so. It's a BYU. Are you thinking of Vicente Fox? Yeah. Yeah. Like, was it a Mexican ambassador or a U.S. Yeah, ambassador? Yeah, U.S. Yeah. Oh. Why you alone? Okay. Anyway, so he said two things in that meeting that kind of kind of got me on another career path. And, and one, I was still single at the time, and finishing my junior year, I think. Uh, and he said, Cond at the time, Condoleezza Rice had changed the State Department in a few ways. One of the ways was she was, in which I think was a good move, but was trying to get diplomats out of the capitals. And that cushy sinecures and out into the country um, so you know, sending them into smaller secondary tertiary cities and and I just knew they were going to stick me in the middle of Kazakhstan somewhere and that concerned me <laughs> on a personal level and the other thing was uh, he said and you should just go really deep on one language and which for me was Russian and one foreign language and, and I being a person with varied interests wanted to study many languages and so that, I kind of felt like, ah. And alongside of that, I um, had started a couple of organizations while here. One was uh, called SEM Club. It doesn't exist anymore, but this was the, the book club for the honors program. Is what it became here, turned into eventually. And we would meet every week, and we would kind of work our way through great works. And so if you weren't um, a comp lit major, you could still kind of finish your great works requirement to, for the honors program. And um, I also wrote a business plan for a venture. Uh, I didn't. I didn't spend any time really at the at the, the business building called Tanner. Tanner. Didn't spend any time there other than that. But uh, but I really loved that, and uh, I, I kind of realized something about myself along the way, which is that I I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I don't want to build things. And um, and so I just became less comfortable with um, the idea of. The bureau, um, and and more comfortable with wanting to go down the entrepreneur entrepreneurial road. So one day I was walking across campus, and uh, but I but I also didn't like business. I just didn't like it, and uh, didn't like summer sales, and I didn't like the Tanner Building, and I didn't like it. <laughs> I was walking across campus one day, and uh, and I saw a sign on a post that was advertising an info session for Harvard Business School, and. Um, and it just kind of caught my attention, and I started thinking about it. And I was like, ah, oh, interesting. And, and so I went, and I did, had two BYU alum come back, who were at HBS at the time, from Finland, uh, Otso and Ami. Uh, did you, you like to raise your head? I served in Finland. You did? Oh, Finland's the best. It's about Finland. Do you know the Kempinen family there? I'm <laughs> familiar. Probably if I remember, it's like my brother. Yeah, they, it sounds like you're in the Kempinen Yeah, very good. So, anyway, I, I really liked them. Like they were they're just really cool guys, and um, I thought they were, they were like their I don't know just demeanor and like the way they thought about life and like their presentation was was really engaging, and so it kind of continued to work on me, and I decided to apply. That was the first year that um, Harvard Business School had a recruiting program called Two Plus Two. And, um, and the idea was for their two-year MBA program, which is what I studied. Um, and meanwhile, Ryan was, I think, doing postdoctoral work in philosophy. So we were on very different academic levels. But, uh, but it, 
it was uh, the two plus two program was to try and diversify the types of admins that, that they that they get because every year they get a lot of applications and the average uh, work experience for incoming students at, at Harvard Business School is it's five years. I think the average age of the person starting is twenty seven. So people you know, they go into investment banking, they go into cons strategy consulting. Uh, finance, corporate operations, whatever, and then kind of come in, and that's the traditional path. So they get a lot of applicants from those uh, profiles, but fewer in areas that are also really important for kind of their strategy over time, particularly when you think about competing with places like Stanford or MIT Sloan School, right? and some of these innovation ecosystems, um, entrepreneurs, uh, nonprofits, uh, and, and kind of public-private work. Um, in, in government, innovation matters hugely in all of this, right? and those are harder profiles. They don't they don't come through the traditional channels as heavily, and so they were trying to break out of that and, and innovate in, in, with respect to recruiting. So that's the program I applied through. Um, I was accepted, I think, because BYU was one of their target schools. They had like ten target schools that first year, and BYU was one of them. And all three of us were international relations majors, and then a language double. And uh, so I thought that was kind of interesting. Like they had a particular person in mind from BYU that they were going for. And, um, and so um, that got me to Boston. I moved to Boston like, in a week of graduating from BYU and uh, didn't know anyone. Um, but uh, a friend of mine at BYU, um, you remember Derek Goatson? Did you ever meet Derek? So Derek had studied philo actually philosophy. Um, at, at BYU as an undergrad. And he had done a philosophy internship at Harvard over a summer. And uh, he'd gotten to know some people there, and so he and I were on a call. I had less than $1,000 in my pocket. I had no job. This was 2009, so it was the Great Recession, last Great Recession. And I um, hadn't studied business. And the 2 plus 2 program, by the way, I should have mentioned this, it's 2 plus 2 because it's two years of working and then two year MBA. So that was a detail I left out there. And, um, and so I, when I got there, I didn't have a job. It was hard to get a job. I had no money, and I didn't know anyone. But I, but I was, like, hungry. So um, my first job was through a friend I made in the war. She was working at Harvard. She had access to, like, this internal jobs board for, for Harvard people. And so, she, like I said, next to her one night, we were chatting, and she, she, like, walks me through the jobs board in her account. There was a research position open at Harvard Law School. Fifteen dollars an hour. So I, I took that, and that was like two years, two months in. I was like down to like a hundred bucks or something. Ramen, you know. So I got this fifteen dollar an hour research job, and I did that for the next eight months. I read every corporate charter and bylaw for every Fortune fifteen hundred corporation. It was a red. Like I got pretty good at just like skimming them, but my job was to code. We were building a massive database of fifteen hundred companies. And every provision in the bylaws and charter, legal documents for the corporations, related to the ability of shareholders in these corporations to take action. So to remove members of management or to, to vote on various matters. So anti-green mail, poison pills, voting thresholds, and so on. So I learned a ton. I also lost some of my eyesight. And, um, <laughs> and uh I had to print them all off physically, by the way. So in my apartment, I had these boxes like stacked and in two or three rows. But that professor, his name is Alan Farrell. He's an economist at uh, Harvard Law School. He's now one of my investors. Um, and it was a, just a great relationship. And I learned a lot. So that was an important experience. Even though it was a, like a, like a, a side gig just to make ends meet. Um, and in the meantime, Eric Goatson, my, my friend, who had spent time in Boston, told me about um, a friend he had made there, Luke Langford, also a member of the church, uh, who was working at a consulting firm called InnoSight. InnoSight is a strategy consulting firm in Boston that was founded by Clay Christensen. Have you heard of Clay Christensen? Mm -hmm. So he was a professor at Harvard Business School and well known for creating the theory of disruptive innovation. And um, I'll get to that later, but uh, Derek had met Luke, who was working there, 
Luke had just graduated from Harvard College. And uh, I chatted with Luke, and we had a, a phone call. It was probably like a 20-minute call. And I told him where I was at, what I was interested in. And, and he said, well, you should read one of Clay's books. And so he recommended one of his books to me, which was The Innovator's Solution. I read it and uh, fell in love with the theory. Um, I was really fascinated by it. And then I also jumped in kind of doing pro bono work or free work for something Luke was working on at InnoSight. At the time, InnoSight had a $50 million venture fund attached to their consulting practice, which didn't last long. But one of the, the, the ventures that the fund had invested in is called uh, Here and Teach. And it was a math, like ed tech startup. So sort of uh, like Khan Academy. Khan Academy ate our lunch is what happened. It's a short story. <laughs> but at the time, Khan Academy and we were like little babies, like trying to teach people math. And um, the, the theory of Karen Teach was you could you give a diagnostic to people that came to the website and created an account and it would ask you a bunch of questions and it would kind of like figure out how you learn. And then it would deliver you lessons in a personalized way based on your learning style. Um, I think like one of the Anyway, I'm not going to get into that. But I did digital marketing for like those eight months of being a researcher at the law school um, just for free. Um, I, actually, I just did it for a summer for free. I got to know Luke. I went into the InnoSight offices and helped him conduct um, interviews and uh, customer tests and things and got to know them all. So later that fall, I applied to become a consultant at InnoSight, which had been like my first real job. Um, and, uh, and so they hired me and they hired me, I think, because they got, they had gotten to know me and we've done some work together. So you can already see like, even within a year, there's like these twists and turns, right? In like non-ideal circumstances. Um, I spent the next year and a half working at InnoSight and I really disliked it like intensely. I thought before going in that it would be this great combination of entrepreneurship and yet the stability of consulting. I could have this guaranteed income, and, but I'd also be doing innovation. What I learned is that as a consultant, you don't do innovation. <laughs> you, you talk about it, and you help like, groups of people think about it, um, but it's innovation by committee, usually. And, and really what you're doing is you are an outsourced, it's actually p political. So most strategy consulting is political fundamentally. In that you're hired by a senior executive at a corporation to do a tremendous amount of work uh, uh, for them a short period of time to validate their agenda. And you're learning things, and there's there's learning that, that, that's taking place, right? But but often um, that was an insight, and I, as an ADD person, don't like index highest on attention to detail. So my PowerPoint slide decks were not up to snuff. And it was a stressful time. Um, but I read all of Clay's books while I was there. I'm better at strategy and theory, um, research, and, and reading and thinking, and, and synthesis, and, and talking with the clients, actually, spending time with them. <clears throat> I was an analyst, and my job was to produce slide, PowerPoint slide decks. And it was hard for me. I wasn't very good at it. That was an important learning. Um, in a number of ways, I, I got a lot from that those those two years. And one of the most important things I got was what not to do. Like when you're learning math, for example, the way you learn math is by learning what not to do, right? As you kind of work the problems. And so um, my career has been somewhat like that too. I left InnoSight to um, finally just do entrepreneurship um, and um, started a company with. Um, uh, friend that I'd met in the ward, Dan Lambert, who studied uh, computer engineering here at BYU, and uh, an app called WIM, and it would suggest things to do based on what you're interested in, in, in a geographic radius around you. And then it would, it would suggest those same things to do to other people in the radius that shared the interest. So it'd bring groups, like affinity groups together ad hoc. That was the idea. And actually, now that I think about it, that came from a lecture here at BYU. Um, and Robert Putnam, who's a poli-sci professor at Harvard, came to BYU, this must have been 2008 or so, to talk about his book, Bowling Alone, which is about the reduction of social capital in society. And that was a really influential book for me. 
um, and we were, I was trying to solve this social, so you see the meaning thread, right? Like I was trying to solve this social issue. The business was a terrible idea. It's a terrible idea because as people get established in a community, their, their social network kind of builds up and very quickly they have more things to do than they know what to do with. Time becomes a really scarce commodity, right? Um, but as like a new single person in a big city, I was like, oh, this is a great idea. Like, I need this, right? Anyway, so learning, that was what first venture. But Dan and I became really good friends. I raised my first investment from people. I also I went through the experience of losing that money and then finding ways to pay it back over time to my investors so that it was the word fiduciary. Anyone? To offer. I mean, I've only heard it on the radio here, okay. but I, I think it would be more of like a, like the, the financial kind of group that handles some money for you. Exactly, yeah. So but to, I think, I'm not going to get the legal definition exactly here, but to be a fiduciary, it's, it's a legal concept, means that you are an agent for a principal, right? So the principal-agent relationship. The principal is somebody whose money you are managing for them or resources of some kind and you're you're to place their interests above your own and you're to ex exercise complete loyalty to them um what does it say like some legal theorists said it was a punctilio of honor most sensitive uh, at some point so you're right so that's to be a fiduciary so i learned some things about what it is to be a fiduciary right when you raise money from someone fiduciary. Yeah, it's important to take that very, very seriously. Um, so, and then Dan and I became really close friends. I then uh, matriculated into business school, and I did a year. And um, also, didn't love my first year um, there. I, it's kind of corporate, corporate despite their investments to become a bit more like Stanford or, uh, or MIT, or, it's still pretty traditional Wall Street. Um, and I just didn't love that. And uh, I didn't love a lot of the corporate job job openings that came through recruiting on campus. And I, I just wasn't sure what, what I wanted to do. Um, the summer before I started, I actually came back to BYU to study history with Richard Bushman. Um, so it was a Mormon history seminar, and I loved it. And that kind of confused me further. I was like, well, I don't know. And, um, and so when Ryan saw me reading history, that's probably what it was. But um, I then left business school for two years. Um, and I felt it was important to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, and uh, so got married, traveled the world for a year, thought carefully about the experiences I'd had. One thing I'll mention to further about Innosite's important strand here is that most of my clients were very large healthcare companies. Johnson & Johnson, Walgreens, Medtronic. And I'd learned about the healthcare industry. And uh, that, that was interesting to me um, on a number of dimensions. So at that time, taking a break from school, um, I thought about international um, work. Uh, I thought about healthcare as, as work that might have inherent meaning, um, caring for people, and um, entrepreneurship and innovation, and disruptive innovation in particular. Being a, a, for those of you that have read Clay, he's, disruptive innovation is kind of low-end market innovation that democratizes access in some way. So much of the innovation that occurs in the world is incremental in nature, and it's sort of sustaining existing businesses or incumbents, disruption is coming up from the bottom. And I see it actually as, as a divine process. Um, and things that are anti-competitive or favor incumbents overly as, as being the opposite of that. Um, and so uh, I tied all of that together into a research project that Clay helped advise me on, which was looking at healthcare innovation in India on the theory that as a very large market with a critical mass of engineering talent and capital uh, and much lower so, uh, kind of average socioeconomic status or economic average income, uh, that this would be an interesting uh, source of disruptive innovation. 
And so I did research on that um, independently for, for two years and found over 30 um, innovations that to me seemed extremely significant. So for example, the world's first handheld ultrasound machine. Ultrasound is the closest thing, we, maybe Star Trek, like the tricorder device, no? Okay. Um, ultrasound's the closest thing we have to that, actually. In, it, it sends sound waves out at very high frequencies, and it, it come back, and algorithms turn those into an image. It's non-radiating. It's extremely cost-effective. It's like these things are hugely democratizing in the right hands. And then with AI on the edge, um, which can interpret the images, you just created something that can do what only doctors could do until very recently. You can put it in the hands of a nurse or a community health worker. And the first one in the world came out of India. Why? Because wealthy people don't wake up in the morning thinking about, hmm, like, how, how to, like, solve this, right? Like, usually innovation is a response to immediate needs or opportunities, right? Um, and so a lot of Clay's traditional examples of disruption came out of post-war Japan. I don't think it's a coincidence, right? Like at that point in time, Japan had a scarcity of physical space, which they still do. Um, they were not wealthy for, for a minute um, and, and very technologically advanced. So Sony Walkman radio, um, you know, Toyota and Honda vehicles, like uh, the 50cc motorbikes, like all the iconic disruptive examples like so many of those came out of post-war Japan and so for me the project was about identifying uh, innovation arbitrage so a little more academic but that got me into thinking about innovation more um, came back to school um, joined a handheld ultrasound venture I kind of funded my travels and research um, one by getting married and uh, I had an income which helped and then and savings which I didn't and then um, also uh, doing sales for another venture. Um, so which we had invested as a family. Another strand I want to pull out here is that when I was went to work for Clay back in 20, 2010, I began to make angel investments into startup companies and other funds. And when I say I made them, what I mean is my dad. Um, <laughs> but I would call him, it was a partnership, because he was in Wyoming uh, working on animals and feeding them and whatnot. And I would call them occasionally, I would say, I found this thing um, that I think is really interesting. And we can talk about it and look at it. And it actually was a great way to work together. And, and we made a dozen or so investments, not large investments, but um, a few of them did very, very well, um, including Clay's fund that his oldest son, Matt, runs called Rose Park Advisors. They invested in a Korean venture called Kupang. Uh, at the C and A stage, Kupang now has 60% of Korea's e-commerce market share. So they're the Amazon of Korea. And um, so I saw what ventures do sometimes, rarely, but sometimes. And um, got to know more about that and um, and, uh, and just to do a time check, right? What are, what are my what are, we go till 5.50 is when, 550. They, okay. when they might have, when class officially ends. Okay, so I'll... I'll wrap this up soon for questions and comments, but um, so tying all those together, when I took time off school, I thought healthcare, investing, innovation, international, and, um, and what's my next step? I'm going to, I'm going to, I went back to school, I graduated, uh, and I joined an ultrasound venture, and I co-founded, so that was my third venture. Pandemic was the one I'd done sales with. They eventually were acquired, so that went well. And then Echinos is still a going concern. And then I co-founded a one called Edalytics with Kendall Clement. Um, we licensed a precision genome editing analytics software to most gene therapy companies. He's the brains behind that. He's a postdoc at Harvard um, doing research in that area. So I was like the business person. And, um, and I'm still on the board there. And then in 2018, I, I founded a venture capital firm called Springtide uh, to just try and scale what my dad and I have been doing successfully for a decade. Um, and, and it ties together a lot of the different strands of experience that I'd had. Um, sales, which is required for fundraising. Um, uh, 
network around innovation and living in a place like Cambridge and Boston was very helpful. Um, and so we uh, just closed on our second fund. Fund one was a $20 million fund. It took me three years to raise that. And it took me the entirety of the first year, 2018, to raise just $5 million. So like a, like a fire or a snowball, I was using these metaphors with Natalie earlier, it, starts, it can start extremely small. And just build, but that the, the exponential function at a certain point really kicks in. And um, and in the meantime, I was hustling as usual and doing side consulting things to pay the bills and uh, and uh, had become comfortable with ambiguity and um, kind of a larger vision of building something. So we've now backed uh, our, our second fund, 65 mil. I may mention that. So we're approaching 100 million total assets under management. We've got 32 companies, all of which are doing amazing things in healthcare. Some of which have failed. They were doing. <laughs> um, but some of which have succeeded. You know, uh, we just had one sell for 150 million dollars. We've you know, got in there when we were 12. And and this is a company called Pathology Watch here in Utah that um, is using AI to improve the diagnosis of, of skin cancer. Um, in, uh, in dermatopathology. So his software eats dermatopathology is kind of what, what Pathology Watch did. And they were acquired by the largest uh, dermatopathology lab in the world out of Australia. There's a hole in the ozone layer above Australia. There are a lot of white people. So it's a bad combination. <laughs> so lots of skin cancer. But they have labs all over Asia. Um, and so this, this technology is, over the next two years, will be integrated in all of their systems and it will be saving millions of lives. So enormous impact, good financial return, um, but you know you have losses along the way. So I'm going to stop there. This is what, what I do day to day now. I'm a managing partner for this firm. There are only four of us that are full-time at the firm. On one, I was the only full-time person. And so again, it's kind of this like growth um, incrementally, but, um, but I really love what I do. And, uh, and so yeah, I'll stop there love questions. I also have like the two philosophical frameworks as skills, but maybe I'll stop to see first if there are any questions. Uh, yeah, Corey. Maybe I'll help pivot you in. Yeah. You know, it, it seems kind of mysterious, I think, for a lot, of, a lot of students to kind of understand this world because I think even for MBA grads, it's kind of mysterious. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> what do you see in others' pathways into the venture, the venture. capital world? Because I've I've heard some, some VCs say, well, you know, there's no path in. You, yeah. Everyone has their own little way to get there. Um, and, it, and it's obvious that you've built that and navigated that really effectively. But what do you see in others who are in the same space and their journey? Yeah, so for me, clearly, it's just a, an organic process literally from scratch. That's what I've been trying to communicate. <laughs> as, and, and that's where my path led me. Never planned to be a fund manager. I, mean, um, I don't care as much about asset management. That doesn't get me going. What I care about is impact, um, and so that's kind of the, you know the way we do that. I think is informed by a mission, which is which is to democratize access, um, and bring down healthcare costs. And so uh, there may be others at our firm that are my minority. Um, some of them that got in, you know, one. Ryan Morley is based here in Utah. He's uh, deputy director of finance for the Mitt Romney 2012 presidential campaign. He studied accounting at BYU. Um, and then he had done ventures. So he had built a company or two, served as a CFO, helped sell one. But he just got involved in the venture world and kind of creating and scaling ventures. Uh, Brad Otto went into investment banking out of undergrad. He was a Minnesota guy. And then worked at United Health Ventures, so corporate venture capital, which is kind of like VC light, that that very secure. Um, you're also subject to like corporate budget things and strategy changes. But um, then he went to Harvard Business School. We hired him from there. Claire Smith, she was at MIT undergrad, um, computational biology, um, and then just went straight into venture, like. I think she did healthcare consulting, but she's Boston based and then had seven years of venture experience when her second fund folded. She's, she's amazing. So I think there are lots of, honestly, lots of paths in. Um, if you want to come in as an employee, 
typically you've got to have really pristine credentials and like some relevant background and experience. If you come in at an entry level, um, most likely that's only a two-year stint. And you go to business school or something. Yeah, I've got a couple questions if people don't have, but I'll just ask one. Um, you're talking about disruptive innovation theory. Um, maybe if Clay was still here, what do you think he would say, or maybe what are your thoughts on AI and its effect on disruptive innovation, and maybe if that theory changes at all, or if it, um, you know, the effect it has on that? Yeah, totally. Um, I, I don't know that, it, so he has a frame, one of his books called The Innovator's Prescription is about healthcare disruption, and it's his thickest one. Healthcare is a beast. There's just a lot, a lot of factors involved, and, um, um, politics too. Uh, but one of his frameworks in there talks about technological enablers and the role that they play in disruption. It's in itself, it is not disruptive. But when paired with a disruptive business model, which has more to do about low end market entry, so you have incumbents that are using AI right, to, to kind of prop up their existing business models and probably charge more. Um, so that really takes the disruptive wind out of the sails of, of AI. But then you have new ventures that are coming using AI to dramatically, say, reduce the cost of goods sold, or the, the, the cost of operation for them, and they charge much less. And maybe by doing so, they open up access to very large new markets at the low end. That's disruptive. Right? So it's, it's, it's merely a technological enabler among many, many others that exist, like flexible electronics, name-coded libraries, or you name it. AI, I, I like to put it in, in perspective. It's just one technological enabler among many, and it's not necessarily disruptive. Or not. It just depends on like who can make it cheaper. Right? Yeah, and like how do they integrate it into a, into a business model? Are they, are they using that as a way to charge much less for it or make something much more accessible? Like handheld ultrasound for nurses? Or are they embedding it into a $2 million MRI machine that only a radiologist can use and they're going to charge two and a half million? That's not disruptive. So. What top? Oh, you said you were going to mention like your two. Oh, yeah. 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 All right, so um, one is um, um, a framework of Clay's that I really love um, called Emerging Purposes Deliberate Strategy. And are any of you familiar with that, that one? Okay, so he says um, for sustaining innovations, those are like the incumbent innovations that are more incremental typically in nature, um, you can use deliberate strategy. So what they teach you in finance to, to build a discounted cash flow model often relies on past data about the real world. Data about how much things cost and how much value you're able to capture and things like that. And you're able to therefore project with some confidence some amount of distance into the future. So that's deliberate strategy. Um, when you are in a situation of novelty, usually like disruption is a good example, um, where you really have a lot more assumptions to work with than facts, <laughs> um, then you should, you should pursue emergent strategy, which, which is you take one step. You might think you know what your final destination is, but you should accept that you don't. And you might take one step that direction and then reassess your assumptions and you test your assumptions. And this is where you fail quickly, often, and cheaply. That's emergent strategy. You learn, and then you pivot, and adjust, you take your second step, maybe slightly a different direction. And then you do the same thing. And then maybe you take another, right? And you end up in a very different destination than where you thought, a priori. Um, but you, you sort of let the unfolding of things guide you. Um, I think there's great wisdom in that. And that applies to life. So that's one. Life is very much, it calls for emergent strategy. Sometimes we quit or don't take opportunity because we feel a pressure from some kind of like deliberate strategy expectation. Like things ought to look a very specific way. Then really we should all be pursuing emergent strategy. Um, 
Uh, the other one is just servant leadership. And you're all probably familiar with that concept. Christian, fundamentally, in nature, right? Christ said, go back, go to the bottom of the table. Right? Uh, and that's servant leadership. So you serve, you lead by serving those around you. And I bring that up because uh, I'll share a story from my mission briefly. So when I got to Ukraine, the Orthodox Church views us as sectarians. One sectarian among many that are there in a very offensive way. Almost like the tip of an American imperial spear or something. That's the view. And that made me feel very uncomfortable. It's like, I did not feel welcome. <laughs> okay. And guilty. Almost like, I, uh, I don't know how I feel about this. And then I read uh, President Hinckley's injunction to invite others to learn truths of the restoration in the spirit of come bring everything that you have and see if we can add to it. And that I felt great conviction about because I had learned, I had tasted the light and truth and goodness that was in the rest, restored gospel. So there's goodness there, and I wanted to share that. And and so that's servant leadership, and that changed things for me totally. I wasn't there to pursue my agenda of converting others, right, or making others kind of do something. Um, in a way, that was unnatural. I was also there. The one implication of that is I'm also there to learn. Which, by the way, in my view, the restoration requires <laughs> for it to achieve its fullness. We need it needs to be by direction. Inspired, they assimilate. You know, think about raising money. That can be awkward. Right? <laughs> you might feel like you're there to ask for something. But if you flip it to a servant leadership perspective, you've done the work and the due diligence required to, to prepare an opportunity, and you're sharing an opportunity for others' benefit. That changes everything. It means that you can go about your work with confidence and succeed. You have the staying power to keep doing it. Sorry. Um, do you feel like the gospel and like having, I guess, like a more spiritual connection has helped in these like having like, I guess like we all have these like personal failures or moments where we're like, oh wait, that idea didn't go where I thought it was gonna go, or like like different experiences you've shared, do you feel like that has kind of like helped the business side of things for you personally, or do you feel like it's just been more of like an anchor in your personal life, like kind of stuff? Really? It definitely played out in the real world. I mean, I, I don't distinguish between the real world and the spiritual world, right? I think it's all connected, and everything we do is, ought to be I think, the gospel. And, um, and for me, definitely, is I've encountered failure like feeling fundamentally confident in my role as a, as a child of God, I think. I don't know what it's like to not have that, but it feels helpful to me. 